Good morning, church. It's good to see you this morning. It's brighter in here already, isn't it? You all thought I was talking about the wall, didn't you? I was talking about you. It's good to see you this morning. We are so grateful you're here. We do not have our TV mounted because Jim said he came in, and it's a whopper, and he couldn't do it by himself, and he's right. So so if I turn every once in a while, it's not because I don't like it or love you. It's just because I need to see what I'm showing you <laughs> So this morning. But we're glad that you're here. Do love the progress that is being made. Do appreciate <coughs> Jim and all the ones <clears throat> he's got lined up and all the ones that have helped him and, and done the work that has been done thus far and the work that will be done. We appreciate that so much. We want to talk this morning about the greatness of salvation. There's a little girl one time who was in an inner city ministry. She's about 11, 12 years old. She'd been riding the bus, coming to, to worship, coming to Bible school and worship for a while. And finally, one Sunday, the, the teacher was talking about heaven. The little girl began to cry a little bit. Her home life was not the best in the world. Her situation was, was dire at best. And so she asked the teacher, she said, do you think that heaven will take little girls like me? The teacher hugged her and assured her, yes. Heaven is for girls like you. Thanks be to God that God has a plan for our lives. It's a plan of salvation. It's a plan that God has provided so that we can spend eternity with him. As we'll see in the lesson this morning, God loves everybody. But yet at the same time, too, spending eternity with everybody, God has limited to those that will follow his plan. But you say, preacher, we look around this morning and most of us have followed that plan. We've heard the word of God. We've believed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. We have repented of our sins. We have changed the direction of our lives to be committed to the Lord. And we have confessed with our mouth that we believe that Jesus Christ is God's son. We've done all that because we can give book, chapter, and verse for all of those things. Whether it's Luke 13, 3 or Romans 10, verse 17. And yes, preacher, we were baptized. According to Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. According to Mark 16, 16 and Matthew 28, 18 through 20, we were baptized so that our sins were washed away. And it was at that point in time when we obeyed the will of God and our sins were washed away that we came in contact with that blood of Jesus Christ that cleansed us from all unrighteousness and made us God's holy and righteous children. We've done that. That's right. But do you remember why that salvation is so great? You say, yeah, because I have a hope of heaven now. Yes. But in the what is called the gospel in miniature, some have called it the Bible in a nutshell. John 3, verse 16, open your Bibles there. Because I want you to look again at that verse. This morning, Nothing new is going to be said. Nothing that you haven't heard before. Nothing that you probably say, I've heard that sermon preached before, and I would agree with you. But it's a reminder in John 3, verse 16, of what the Hebrew writer wrote in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? John 3, verse 16 tells us about the greatness of that salvation. As we travel the road of life, we have to understand, and sometimes we forget, just how great God's salvation is, just how wonderful and how beautiful, even in, when we know that that scene, that cross, was from a standpoint of physical, was ugly and brutal. It's because of that cross 
that as we travel down that road of life, we hear the words in the end, well done. But what is it that makes salvation so great? Well, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and whoever believes in him should not perish, but have, and depending upon the version you use, this is the New King James, have everlasting life. God loved you enough that he gave his only begotten son. And so we look at that and we understand that salvation is great. John 3 verse 16 tells us salvation is great, but it tells us why. It tells us, first of all, the one who made it all possible for God. For God. This is the same God that in Genesis chapter 1 spoke into existence this world. For in six days, the world out of, or God out of nothing created this world and all things therein. Nehemiah proclaimed the creation of God. In Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 6, Nehemiah reminds us of God. He says, you, you are Lord alone. You've made the heaven and heavens and all things therein. The sea, the things that are therein, the earth and all things Jeremiah 32, Jeremiah also talked about the hand of God creating us, creating this world. That God, that God that created everything, and then according to Acts chapter 17 and verse 28, that it is by him and through him that we have all things, but it is through him that we exist. Who upholds, remember what Paul said there on Mars Hill, who upholds all things by the power of his word. He keeps it going. He keeps it going. He makes sure that, that the sun rises and the sun sets, if you will. He makes sure that, that we have what we need. That God, that God that created, that God that sustains, that God that holds us up, that God that maintains, that God. That God that the Bible talks about in such simple terms as the creator, the sustainer, the omnipotent one. Oh, preacher, we can't understand. You know, we talk about his omnipotence, and we talk about his omniscience, his all-knowing, and we talk about, about his omnipresence and how in the world can he be present everywhere. I'm just present in one place, and that's all I know about. And yet God is present everywhere, and he keeps everything going. And in many ways, yes, beyond our true ability to understand by faith, we see that greatness of God. We see that God that is above all and through all. We see that God who, who is able to do so much. But yet, he's the one that's provided salvation. The psalmist, Psalm 27 and verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The implied answer is no one. The implied answer is, is what? Well, well, you shouldn't be afraid of anyone. And then the psalmist again. In Psalm 34, the very last verse, verse 21 of that psalm, or verse 22, excuse me, of that psalm, makes this wonderful statement. He says, the Lord redeems the souls of his saints, or of his servants. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants. And none of those who trust in him will be condemned. Now, the psalmist, the psalmist trolled us like it was. He says, the Lord redeems the souls of his servants, the souls of, his, of those that follow him. But of those that follow him, those that follow his path, those that follow his plan, he says he'll make sure that none of them are condemned. Salvation is great because of God, of who he is, for he being the one that provides for us. But go back to the text. In John 3, it says, God, what? So loved. Don't you like that? We like the idea of love, don't we? We like the idea of being loved. We like the idea of loving others. 
You know, as the old song goes, what makes the world go round is love, sweet love. It's the only thing. There's really not enough of. We 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 like the idea of love because we understand that at the base of it is, as we have so often defined, it is the desire for the good of the other. In other words, we want what's best. I want what's best for my wife, and I believe she does for me as well. I want what's best for for child and and daughter-in-law and grandchild, and I think they do for me as well. I want what's best for you. And so I'm willing to do what's best for you. God loved. Well, preacher, that makes sense. Because in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, John says that this is love. We love one another for God is love. Now, sometimes we, we have difficulty with that. We say, how is God love? God is the epitome of love. Now, that does not negate the justice of God. It does not negate the righteousness of God. It does not negate the idea that God is a fair and equal God. It does not negate the fact that the Bible says that God is a consuming God. But yet at the same point in time, too, John 3.16 says God loved. God's love is a love that's immeasurable. In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul says, beginning in verse 17, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and breadth and height and depth of his love, that you you might be able to, to understand just how far God's love reaches. It has height. It has depth. It has width. In other words, there's no sinner that's so sinful, God doesn't love them. There's no righteous man that is so righteous that God doesn't love them. And there is no one that is without the outstretched arms of God that's outside of it that God doesn't love. God loves us. We teach our children those little songs of Jesus loves me and God loves the little children of the world. And I'm not so sure from time to time we don't need to sing them as adults in the auditorium and worship. You say, oh, they're so simple. They're too simple. No, no, they're not. They have a great message. And the message is that God's love is a love that extends in all directions and extends to, to everyone. God loves everyone. God doesn't just love the folks in the United States. He doesn't just love the folks in Tennessee. Now, I see why he may love us a little bit better. We've got it great. But God loves the person in the Ukraine. God loves the person that's in Russia. God loves the, the person in India and Sri Lanka. God loves the, the person that's in Albania and the person that's in Greece. God loves them as well. You name a place, you name a country, you name a person. And I can tell you with great affinity and great assuredness, God loves them. But that love ends up being demonstrated. Paul would write in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 that God commendeth. The word commendeth there means to demonstrate, to show. God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Did you catch what Paul said? Paul said, when you were not what God would have you to be. When you, and he doesn't pull any punches. Stop and think about that. You say, oh, he was addressing he was addressing the, the Jewish background. He was addressing those folks that, that and he was alternating, actually, Jewish background and, and Greeks. And he was, he was addressing those individuals. And he was saying, look, look. They 
sand. And each one was pointing at the other. Kind of interesting, you read Romans chapter 1, and you read Romans chapter 2 and chapter 3, as they're going back and forth, you can see them, you can see them laughing at each other, say, I, as Paul would thus address the fact that all of you in chapter 3, you've all sinned. There's not a one of you that hasn't sinned. You've all fallen short of the glory of God. You've all fallen short of what God wants you to be and what you're supposed to do. Imagine right there, if you will, you're seeing this epistle for the first time. You're listening to it. Your ears turn off. Why? Because he's telling me God says that I can't make it. The friends, those folks, thankfully kept listening. Because when you get to that fifth chapter in verse 8, Paul says, God showed his love toward us. Why? Because what John said, God's love. God loves us and God shows his love towards us. And it's a universal love. A love that, that the Hebrew writer talked about in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. We see Jesus, who's made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death. You remember what it says? For everyone. It doesn't matter. That's God's love. That's God's love for us. And in this, the love of God was manifested towards us. And that he gave his own begotten son. John 3, verse 16, yes, but 1 John 4, verses 9 and 10. And this was manifested. The word manifested just simply means made known. He showed. He demonstrated. That's what, he, what Paul said in, first, in Romans 5, verse 8. God demonstrated. God showed. Salvation's great because of the very virtue that prompted our salvation. And it is that of love. But then go back to John 3, verse 16. God so loved the world, and he gave his only begotten son. Salvation is great because of the price that was paid. How do we come up with the value of something? Well, you know, we go to the market. We go to the open market, or we go and we say, well, whatever anybody will give for it, that's, that's how much it is. Now, let me ask you. How do you value a gift? How do you value a gift? Hopefully, you value it. Suzanne and I gave a gift to somebody one Christmas. And by May of the following year, because you know the year starts, they already had it in a yard sale. Oh, that was valued. Thank you. And we know that for a fact because we saw. We value a gift because of who gave it. We value a gift because of the sacrifice that was made. Wildflowers picked from, from a yard by a granddaughter or grandson in many ways, means more than a dozen roses sent by your spouse, right? My wife's shaking her head. Of course, bless her heart, <laughs> she ain't got a dozen roses too often from her husband. <laughs> but it's the sacrifice that's made that causes that gift to be so valuable. It may not, from a monetary standpoint, it may not cost a lot, but for them it might have. And it's a sacrifice. It is what they have given, and is what they have given not out of abundance, but what it is given that has cost them, whether it's time, whether it's money, whether it's effort, no matter what it is. That's the value of a gift. The value of your soul, the value of your salvation was the death of Christ. Yeah, he was made a little lower than the angels. He was found with glory and honor, but he tasted death. He died. 
but he died in order that, that I might be free. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself, according to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. Now, I like that because it reminds me of two things. It reminds me, first of all, that Christ offered himself. Just a couple of weeks ago, we used John, the 10th chapter, in verse 17, in which Jesus says, Herein does my Father love me because I lay down my life. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up. In other words, here's what Jesus said. If you go back and read the whole context of John, the 10th chapter, talking about the good shepherd and being the good shepherd, Jesus said, I'm the one that ultimately decided whether I would give my life. Oh, yes, it was the plan of God. Oh, yes, that's what God wanted. But Jesus said it was up to me. It was on his shoulder that our salvation sat. And guess what? He went to that cross. He went to that cross willingly. He went to that cross lovingly. He went to that cross because he could see the the if you will, the humanity before him, the humanity that was at his time, and the humanity was yet to come, that would include us. And he realized we needed a Savior, and he was the one, and God was depending upon him, and he came through. Jesus died for us. And to him that loved us, John would write, In Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. And washed us from our sins by his blood. He's talking about Christ there. And he says, he loved us and he washed us. How? By his death upon his cross for us. Oliver Cromwell, you may remember him and studied history. He was basically he was the leader of of uh, England, Ireland, and Scotland when they were all together in the 1600s. 16, I think he was born in 1639, so that kind of gives you a point of reference. Cromwell had taken a man that had deserted the army because he was basically known for protecting the British Isles. Had taken a man that had deserted the, the, the army, and he brought him before him, and he condemned the young man. He said, you're a deserter. I condemn you to die by the firing squad at sundown as the bell tolls. They carried the young man off. His girlfriend came and begged Cromwell, please, please let him live. He made a mistake. He's sorry. Let him live. Cromwell said, no, no way. Not going to let him live. He will die by firing squad when the bell tolls at sunset today. As the sun set, as per usual, the bell was supposed to toll. But the old man that had tolled the bell for years was very deaf. And the young girl had gone to him and begged with him not to ring the bell at sundown because of her boyfriend, her fiancé. And the old man, being up under that bell for years, could not hear. And so when it came time for sundown, he began to pull the rope to toll the bell. But no one in the area heard the tolling of the bell. And without the tolling of the bell, the young man could not die by virtue of the firing squad. People wanted to know why didn't the bell ring at the tolling or at to, at the time of the sundown. And before long, a group of individuals brought the young man's fiance who had begged for his life. They brought her in before Cromwell, hands bloodied, skin just shredded. She had gone and grabbed the tongue 
of the bell and hung on for dear life as the bell was told and her body was slapped against the sides of the bell. Cromwell asked her why, and she said to save my fiance. And she said, take him. He's yours. His life is spared. He's worthless. He said, you can have him. You've saved him by your actions. And they went on their way. Jesus Christ went to a cross. And he died for us. Salvation is great because of the price that was paid. Jesus went to that cross. He was beaten before he got there. A crown of thorns was placed upon his head. While he hung upon that cross for those six hours, there were folks that went by him. There were folks that laughed at him. There were folks that spit upon him. There were folks that talked about him. Jesus there, as open as he could be, basically all he had on was a loin cloth to a tree. Spikes in his wrists and in his hands. Could not move, could not get out. Flies everywhere. He didn't do that because he just thought, well, that would be a fun way to die. He didn't do that because he was a man that was a criminal. He did that because that was God's plan for us. That was the price that had to be paid. That valuable gift. You can never, I can never repay back. But it tells me that God loves me enough that notice what he says, that he gave his only begotten. Some of the modern versions translate the Greek word monogenes that's there, unique, one of a kind. That's correct. That's really correct. Jesus was unique. He was one of kind. He was his only son. And he gave him for us, not not son of many, not a, a son of thousands, not a son of hundreds, but his only son. And he gave him for you. He gave him for us. But then your salvation and my salvation, our salvation is great because from that which it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes on him should not perish. Some have taken the word perish and have taught it to mean destruction, annihilation. In other words, when we die, you either, according to their teaching, you either go to heaven or you're, you're finished. No more. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that there are actually two places that one may go. Heaven which we rejoice in and have our hope in, and hell. And as the, the, the curtains are drawn back by God into a picture of hell, we see it as a place of utter disgust. We see it a place of dastardly people. We see it as a place of disdain. We see it as a place that that is. The rich man in Lazarus in Luke 16, talking about Hades. You know, preacher, that's not Gehenna. I, I realize that, and that's for a different time and a different lesson. But we see the torment for the rich man who had a good life, who fared sumptuously, who wore purple. He had it great in life. When he died, he didn't. And it says that he, being in hell, that he, being in torment, lifted up his eyes and asked that he might have a drop of water, that it might cool his tongue. Now, is hell from the standpoint of literal fire? Don't think so. Why? It's a spiritual realm. I think what God is doing is using what is, in our estimation, as far as physical world, the most painful 
the most dastardly, the most difficult of punishments possible to imagine. And he's saying, look, he says, this man being in torment, he said, he said, can you can you just a drop of water? Oh, I know you've been out in the yard working and you go in and you get one of the 16 ounce bottles of water that you have in your refrigerator, man, you can drown, down it in a second. And you think, oh, well, that was good to a parched tongue. Hell's worse than that. John 3 verse 16 says, your salvation is great because you don't have to worry about spending eternity with folks that are unrighteous. Imagine, if you will, you're thrown in what we would consider, now maybe incorrectly so, and maybe this is going to come off politically incorrect, and I, I hope that it doesn't. I hope you get the picture that I'm trying to paint. But there are people in this world, from a standpoint of loving their soul and wishing they would obey the gospel, I do. But they have done some of the most dastardly of acts imaginable. For mongers, murderers, idolaters, those that Paul lists that have abused themselves with mankind. I don't want to associate with those people from an eternal standpoint. Now, do I mind talking to them here upon this earth? No. Do I mind trying to teach them the gospel here upon this earth? Absolutely not. Why? Because we go back to the very second point. God loves them. And I'm to love them too. But do I want to be around them for an eternity? Not really. I don't have to worry about that. God separates, according to Matthew chapter 25, God separates the sheep from the goats, right? God's going to do the separation. The Lord's going to do the judgment. It's That's going to be taken care of. I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about me. But I know that in the end, I hear the words, well done, the good and faithful servant. While the righteous will go into life eternal, what about the unrighteous? Matthew 25 says that they'll hear the words depart from me and they'll go into everlasting punishment reserved beginning by the way, verse 41 of Matthew 25 go through verse 46 those that will hear the words depart from me will be told to go away into everlasting everlasting eternal punishment we can talk about all the different stories about how long is eternity. Just know this. It's a long time. It's longer than the preacher preaches on Sunday morning. And that's long. John 3.16 says, I'm saved from that place. I don't have to spend eternity with Satan. I don't have to spend eternity with him. I don't have to just take and worry and be concerned about where I'll spend eternity because of the salvation that God offers. And so salvation is great because I'm assured that I'll miss that place of eternal punishment. But then salvation is great because of the ultimate treasure that it gives us. Everlasting life. Eternal life. Preacher, I thought eternal life was promised here upon this earth. Oh, yes. But it gets us into a whole different sermon. Eternity with God. Everlasting life. God, that cannot lie, according to Titus chapter 1, verse 2, has promised us what? Eternal life. God has promised us that you can live forever, but not just live forever, but live forever with him. That you can go to heaven, that you can hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, that you can be the individual that's introduced, if you will, into that place called heaven where the righteous 
will live. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more tears. There'll be no more sorrow. There won't be, there won't be any bars in heaven. There won't be any prisons in heaven. There won't be any drugstores in heaven. There won't be any places of ill repute in heaven. But a place of precious children and God's children, a place of precious books. As we studied here a couple of weeks ago. A place where God and his angels will be. A place where I can sit with the Lord and talk. And spend eternity with Peter and Paul and James and John. Talk about their travels, their journeys, their defense of the gospel. A place where I can spend eternity with my physical father. And my mother. And while, yeah, as Suzanne and I early in our marriage, we were talking about that verse that talks about in heaven you'll neither... No, you know, you won't be married. And she said, we won't be married. At that point, we were early in marriage. And she said, oh, no. Now she says, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> but do I believe I'll know who she is? Yes. And next year, we will celebrate our 40th anniversary, Lord willing. And that's just but a drop in a bucket called eternity eternal life foster walker lived in memphis tennessee foster walker walked into a store in memphis tennessee and a gunman came in and was sticking everyone up and pointed the gun at foster walker and said give me your money old man or i'll shoot you and you'll go to eternity and he said shoot on brother he said, I've already said my prayers for the morning and I read my Bible. I'm ready to go. Take me on. Don't threaten me with peace and joy. Robert didn't know what to do and walked out without taking anything from anybody. God to love the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever should not perish. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have life everlasting. Now, here comes the question. And the question is, is all that I have to do believe? Well, understand believing is standing as, if you will, a word for the whole. Because if you notice in the introduction, we said you believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and live faithfully that you'll hear the words, well done. And that's correct. We don't go back on that. Why? Because we have scriptures. Think about verses in the Bible that talk about you're saved. Yes. John 3.16 says that I'm saved by faith. But I can go through and I can point you to the fact that the blood of Christ saves me. So I've got to figure out how to come in contact with that blood. I, the grace of God, Ephesians chapter 2, saves me. I've got to figure out how the, blood, how the grace of God, I can reach that. There's a list of about 25 things you go through and study your Bible of things that it says we're saved by. It not only says I'm saved by faith, but it also says I got to repent. I got to confess. With the heart, man believes in righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. I'm not sure why it's hung up on this idea of when the Bible says you got to be baptized or to be saved. We can't do that. We shouldn't do that because it says we've got to have faith. Well, it says we've got to have grace. We've got to have faith. We, we've got to be, we've got to repent. We've got to confess. We've got to be baptized. Don't get hung up on it. Why? Because God said it. That simple. But guess what? When I've done those things, Matthew 25 where the Lord is separating the sheep from the goat and the righteous from the unrighteous. The righteous hear these words, well done, good and faithful servant. Can that be said of you this morning? If that cannot be said of you, if you can't hear the words, well done, 
You can change it this morning. Our prayer, our plea, she'll come. While together we stand and sing.